In this film, I talk to Dr. Jordan Vaughan about his experiences in diagnosing and treating abnormal clotting in long COVID, and why fibrin breakdown might be key. In fact, there's an off-the-shelf test to discover why you might have a genetic predisposition to struggle to break down this particularly nasty COVID-related sludge in your blood. Let's dive in. Hi, Jordan. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. Um, it's great. Great to be here. Um, could you just uh, could you just describe for us a little bit of your clinical backgrounds and how that's brought you to where you're working now? Yeah, so I am a uh, son of a physician and uh, internist, uh, and actually uh, both my father as well as I have a background in engineering previously. So uh, his him's mechanical, mine's a, a biological and chemical. So it does give a little bit of a different kind of scope in terms of what our background was before medicine, because we're. Um, but you know, for the last. Uh, 12 years have been an internist that uh, basically has his own practice. My father started our practice the year I was born. Um, and really, we kind of have always wanted to really treat and help patients in, in the clinical setting, um, kind of always done our own thing, which is whatever we thought was best for the patient. And uh, really, you know, kind of separating ourselves from kind of the I guess, big academic medical center or big kind of hospital system. And ex especially in the last three years, that's been really um, beneficial to be able to help people uh, because sometimes the answers aren't necessarily uh, coming from some, you know, bureaucrat uh, in the central government. So, Indeed. Uh, so can you tell me how you sort of became involved in treating people with long COVID and what brought you into this space in particular? In regards to uh, just acute COVID, what I was starting to notice, and probably a lot of uh, Jaco Lobsher can uh, attest to this, you know, around June of 2020, we started to realize that the coagulation issues were a huge part of this. And then you just kind of spend a lot of time in the literature. And the cool thing about the current environment is we really can, you know, research and find out what people are doing all over the world. And so as we saw that, and uh, I started intervening in the acute phase with anticoagulants, antiplatelets, keeping people out of the hospital, understanding the vascular phenomenon of what acute COVID is. That's when I said, uh, you know, th this is interesting. And as I was reading and as people that weren't that sick started showing up in my office, meaning in the acute phase, weren't that sick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the people that we, you know, weren't having to come to me, weren't on oxygen, those kind of things. Uh, but these people started showing up. Uh, the first couple of people that I saw were uh, college athletes. Um, so these college athletes had a very objective way to say, look, I really didn't even know I had COVID other than the fact that they were testing me all the time. And then they knew they had COVID. And then, you know, two to six weeks out from having COVID, all of a sudden their performance just deteriorated. And the harder they worked, uh, the worse it got. And so that was kind of my first introduction to this. And really that's when I started, you know, digging in the research and really connecting with uh, Risha, Doug and, uh, and Jaco because what they were describing really made sense clinically. And so from that point, that's really kind of where it was like, okay, yeah, this did work in the acute phase. And some of the things I was noticing in the acute phase was those people that I treated with antiplatelets, anticoagulants, not only did they get better, usually they didn't come back with long COVID. And not only that, usually their chest x-rays look better, quicker, um, compared to people that in the acute phase were not as sick, if that makes sense. And so uh, it started to kind of make pathophysiological sense that maybe long COVID in many ways is persistence of the vascular phenomenon of the acute phase or, you know, a part of it. So, so to your mind, where does the clotting, you know, the microclots and sort of abnormal blood function, where does that sit inside sort of this complex jigsaw puzzle of sort of a totality of long COVID? What, how do you see that relating to other things like maybe autoimmunity or immune function yeah. or inflammation and everything else? Yeah. So, so again, the first patients I saw were usually very uh, fit, college athlete type people. And so, you know, they didn't have a lot of pre-existing comorbidities, autoimmune issues previously. So um, I was, I would say it was a little easier to kind of parse out that, you know, the macro, uh, the microvascular stuff was probably the big part of their problem. And the other thing is that the intervention helped significantly. I mean, we had an objective finding that when they went back, got back to, you know, uh, really training that finally their training actually made their times better, not worse. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of a fascinating thing. Now, as you move up the ladder to older, uh, you know, patients, patients with other comorbidities, it's harder to parse out because again, there's a lot of other functions. I mean, autoimmunity, uh, immune dysfunction in general, viral persistence, all of these things are contributing. Um, and I really think the microclot, the kind of clotting pathology, uh, is really what I would call kind of the residual junk or sludge left over. And so if you really don't deal with the first two, meaning like the 
viral persistence or immune issue, uh, you know, it's going to be kind of a, not a, necessarily a waste. It's going to be harder to clean up the mess because the mess is still going to be produced, if that makes sense. So that's yeah, kind of so, how I divide it up. So you're seeing it as essentially a downstream effect of, yeah, yeah exactly. So how do you go, up, I mean, so obviously I know Yako um, treats people with clopidogrel, aspirin, uh, pixaban on the whole. What might you, how, do, how does your treatment look and how do you go about approaching things like the potential for viral persistence or, you know, immune issues? How, how do you go about sort of trying to go upstream from, <laughs> from that sludge? Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of that kind of uh, autoimmune history and those kind of things we kind of parse out in the kind of the, just the, really the history of present illness, like kind of giving us, you know, what is, who are you as a person when you present? And really, you know, you kind of, again, it takes some clinical judgment to parse out. Okay. Yeah. You might have um, some autoimmune issues talking about family history, talking about things that they might've had before and after. I mean, even the fact that mast cell dysfunction is kind of something that a lot of people see, and maybe they had kind of a little bit of maybe some mast cell issues previously, but they weren't to the, to the degree that now that they've been exacerbated. So you kind of have to tease that out. Now I will say, Jaco is really kind of my, um, you know, in many ways, mentor on this therapy. I mean, this, I, I looked at Jaco as somebody who was brilliant. And not only that, took a chance and said, let's try this. And his, his you know, what he's done is really helping lots of people. Because for the most part, my triple therapy or triple treatment is basically straight off what Jaco is doing. Um, a couple of things that I've added uh, are related to what I've kind of found, and I'm hopefully going to publish with Doug Kell pretty soon, that there's a subset of people uh, that, and it's a fairly common uh, genetic subset, that have issues with fibrin breakdown to begin with, okay? And because of that, uh, they, you know, you get this abnormal fibrin, this amyloid fibrin that's produced, but imagine that your factory for breakdown didn't work well to begin with, okay? And so, you know, you might've been fine. You might've been, you know, low fat, you might've had, you know, uh, been really active and it was never an issue. And now all of a sudden you get this tsunami or a thousand trucks back up to your factory with abnormally packed fibrin and your factory wasn't that good of a factory to begin with. Okay. And so that's what I've really kind of teased out because a lot of these people have issues on the fibrinolytic side, not just on the coagulation side, coagulation side, definitely there's a whole subset of those people, but it was weird to find that a lot of these people that are completely healthy, what they really have is an issue with fibrinolysis. Like they, but you know, it wouldn't have been something that they would have probably even never known in their whole lifetime had they not had a tsunami of fibrin show up to their factory door. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So how do you identify these people? So uh, and originally when I was using triple therapy, some of these people would definitely get better. But when we would remove uh, the aspirin, clopidogrel and Eliquis or Vaxaban, um, some of their symptoms would come back. So what I started to do was kind of explore the fibrinolytic side. And what I've kind of identified is something called plasminogen activator inhibitor one, which is actually very elevated anyway in, um, in COVID, acute COVID. And all that does is inhibit tissue plasminogen activator, which is the thing that actually produces or allows you to produce plasmin and plasmin is what breaks down fibrin. Okay. So if you have it, if you have overproduction of the inhibitor of the thing that makes the thing that breaks down the, the, the issue, you're going to be you know in trouble. So there's a really a FDA approved uh, test for 4G, 5G. It's actually a fairly common um, genetic polymorphism. And it's more common probably in whites and Asian European ancestry uh, as well. And, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, it's, you know, was discovered around pregnancy in the 60s, but this, this polymorphism was discovered uh, more appropriately in the 90s. And it's kind of associated with early coronary disease, the kind of random person that got clots for no good reason in the hospital. Those are these people. Um, but there's a lot more of them than we think there is. I mean, then we kind of realize, and I think COVID's kind of uh, exposed that. So I mean, my cohort, about 200 people, about 90% of them had this polymorphism. And so that's going to be an interesting thing. To, I mean, obviously I have to uh, get, you know, through the publishing kind of, I'm not a publisher, obviously I'm a yeah. clinician. So, but from an academic standpoint, it really helps me because if somebody's issue is lack of ability to break down fibrin and they have long COVID, targeting that is, is a huge part of it. I'm not saying it's the only thing. But I'm saying, you know, gosh, you know, that's going to be the thing to really hit at. And it's it's uh, the other thing we try to do is knowing that, knowing that their factories for breakdown don't really work. I mean, every time you get an infection, you're going to probably make some fibrin. It may not be this nasty, bad fibrin, but if you're not good at breaking down fibrin, um, that's not good. We need to optimize your factory for doing it. Does that make sense? So it's more um, of a... Absolutely. Um, 
So if people think this might be an issue for them, how would they go about getting this tested? So I use, you know, it's, it's a validated test in the U.S. And you can just actually ask for your, um, uh, you know, internist or whatever to basically check for PI-01, 4G, 5G. And there's a heterozygote. So normal is 5G, 5G. And the, the gene abnormality of this gene exertion is on the promoter region. Okay, the promoter region of the gene is basically every time you're told to make this protein, if the promoter region is, is abnormal or overexpressed, meaning you, so typically the heterozygote makes five times as much as the normal person and the homozygote for 4G, 4G makes 10 times. And so um, the actual plasminogen activator inhibitor level itself is very fastidious. It's diurnal, it, it, it rapidly decreases. So it's more important to know that are you the person that every time you're told to make this, do you make more than the average person? Does that make sense? So that's why the genetic or what I would call polymorphism. So it's PI-1 polymorphism 4G, 5G. And you can order it, Quest, LabCorp, all of them do it. It takes about two weeks to get back. But that's really an important thing, not only to know in long COVID, it's really an important thing to know kind of in what I would call where we're going in medicine, which is the small vessels. How do we keep them open? So long COVID is quite a heterogeneous condition. People come with certain clusters of different kinds of symptoms, whether they may be dysautonomic led or mast cell led or fatigue and brain fog led or whatever. Are there certain groupings of those symptoms that come to you that A, seem to present with this sort of uh, genetic difference, or B, you know will respond well to the anticoagulant therapy? And are there groups that maybe you see and think that's less likely to respond as well. So again, I mean, the funny thing about this PI-1, 4G, 5G is it's it, the phenotype that I'm seeing. And again, I've seen, you know, again, an N of 200, 300 people. Um, it's usually somebody that's young and previously extremely fit. They're usually low body fat. Uh, there, a lot of them are women that are low estrogen, high testosterone. So they're the woman that, you know, basically has no body fat on her, goes to the gym six days a week. Um, and, uh, usually has some kind of menstrual or uh, infertility history. And then that, again, I, I, I'm trying to be very general here, but if that, if, if they, if I talk through them with the history and that's what they have, I can almost guarantee they're going to have, uh, this pile one issue and they are going to benefit immensely from this therapy. Um, but you know, if you kind of go through that and they don't have any of that, uh, and as well as if, you know, you parse through it and they have kind of a history of autoimmunity or kind of, uh, you know, different kind of allergies or atopic issues, um, they might be more on the autoimmune side, obviously going through and asking them about history of clots, not just in them, but in their parents. And usually they're random clots, meaning like, oh yeah, yeah, my dad had to be on Eloquist. Well, why the heck your dad is, why is your dad on Eloquist? It's like, well, he got this clot. Do they have any reason for it? You know, like, and so again, those kind of people are the people that probably um, already had issues with breakdown, fibrin breakdown. And when they are, uh, you know, basically, have the uh, spike protein exposure, they're going to make, they're going to have a hard time breaking down the byproduct, meaning this, this kind of nasty amyloid fibrin. So generally speaking, what kind of results are you seeing when you're treating this group of patients? And are, do you have any way of sort of quantifying those results and sort of getting a sense for how effective the treatment actually is? Yeah. So, so usually, I mean, previously what I would use is some surrogates that, um, you know, obviously symptomology is probably... <laughs> best indicator the the athletes were really good because they had objective evidence of their times, you know, they're swimming or running. Usually they were kind of track or, or, or swimming athletes. Um, but, you know, we're starting to basically utilize um, even the microscopy that we use. I actually do immunofluorescence in the office, which is kind of, again, goes to show you that I'm, you know, kind of an independent guy, I see something and have the resources to say, Hey, this seems like the right thing to do for my patients. Uh, hey, Risha, will you teach me? And then get the get the stuff and get it done. Uh, yeah, I can tell you that we can see uh, results in terms of the breakdown, the the change of clots, the kind of globular down to very small kind of what a particulate. Um, and uh, so that's one of the ways we do it. Um, the uh, the goal would be to have some type something like flow cytometry that could really give us a you know amount per deciliter uh, that's there on presentation, and then amount per deciliter you know, after treatment. So, but a lot of it is, is feel. I mean, unfortunately medicine's an art and uh, it's not, you know, we don't have a perfect way yet to tell you, but um, it, it does, it does interestingly enough matter how I end the therapy, meaning 
Um, and that goes back to how I kind of discovered this issue with, you know, breakdown was that people that we kind of stopped it in that their symptoms came back, it seemed to have be this subset. And it's what I try to do in endotherapy is now how do we risk modify you? How do we optimize your fibrin breakdown? Not only for just, you know, post COVID, but for every time they're going to get, you know, the flu or, uh, you know, other things like that. How do we, how do we help their body when fibrin's produced, break it down? So, um, but in terms of quantifying, it's still, still difficult. We're, we're, you know, I guess I, I would say this, the funny thing about being in this um, world is, you know, for the most part, a lot of times in medicine, when you are taught something, you already have a way, you know, already have the pathophysiology, you already have a way to identify it, you already have a way to quantify it. And heck, you already have, probably have treatments. I mean, I feel like we're at like identify pathophysiology, you know, that's why it's so you know, the microclots, the chronic ischemic reperfusion, the fact that, you know, low tissue oxygen or local tissue hypoxia is such a compelling pathophysiology to explain so many of these multiple symptoms. I think that's, that's when I, when I started to read uh, Risha and uh, Doug and Jocko's work, I said that, 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 that makes sense to what I'm seeing. And then th when I tried the intervention, the intervention worked, which is also very compelling. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, you've got to, now identify. So now doing microscopy, but then the next step we got to do is quantify it. And I, I, we're not there yet. We're, we're coming up with ways to do it, but um, that it's like you're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're inching along this discovery, if that makes sense. And that's sometimes is it, it's a, it's a fascinating thing to be in because a lot of times we just take for granted that it's already been identified and quantified and have a, a appropriate treatment, but we're kind of, we don't, we don't have that yet. Hope you found that interesting and helpful. Next up is part two, discussing the latest state of the research on the subject. Look after yourselves, until next time.